and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. Tonight, we focus on Mississippi's bicentennial. We have assembled a panel to talk about the state's past, present, and future. They will join us in just a moment. But first, here are some interesting firsts from when Mississippi officially became a state. Mississippi became the 20th state to join the Union on December 10th, 1817. The first state constitutional convention assembled in the town of Washington. Under the 1817 Constitution, only white property owners and members of the militia had the right to vote. President James Monroe signed the order admitting Mississippi as a state after Congress approved the state's constitution. Mississippi's first governor was David Holmes. He was born in Pennsylvania and grew up in Virginia. Prior to becoming governor, he served as a congressman from Virginia, then governor of what was then the Mississippi Territory, an area that included present-day Mississippi and Alabama. Holmes County is named after him. The first state capital was not Jackson, but Natchez. It remained the capital city until lawmakers decided to move the capital to Hines County. The state legislature met for the first time in Jackson in 1822. There are lots of things happening to celebrate the state's 200th birthday, and joining us to talk about them and the state's history are the Honorable Fred Banks. He is a former Mississippi Supreme Court Justice. Katie Blunt is director of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Pam Jr. is the director of the new Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And Rachel Myers is the director of the new Museum of Mississippi History. And we welcome all four of you to Add Issue. Let me start by getting uh, perspective from each of you on the significance of this moment in time when we celebrate 200 years of Mississippi. Uh, Judge Banks, let's start with you. Well, I think it's human nature that we, we celebrate uh, large birthdays, birthdays <laughs> with zeros and fives, mm -hmm. uh, and 200 is a pretty big birthday. It's the birthday for our state, and it's a, it's a cause for celebration. Katie? I'm really proud of the way Mississippi is celebrating its bicentennial, uh, not just with the Legacy Project, the opening of the two Mississippi museums, but also there's been a great grassroots spirit of excitement about the, the bicentennial throughout the year and across the state. Pam? When I think about this bicentennial, I'm thinking about Mississippi being this melting pot of cultures coming in together and making this place called Mississippi. So yeah, very excited for what's about to happen in a, in a month. And Rachel? Yeah, just to add, from the History Museum perspective, I'm excited about 200 years and the hundreds of years before and then what is to come in the future. Katie, as part of this celebration, uh, there's a historic flag that is, that is on tour, so to speak. Tell us That's a little right. bit about that. The 20 star flag flew over the United States in 1818, marking the admission of Mississippi to the Union. And it was only the U.S. flag for about a year and then the 21st state came on. So there were never very many of them, and we have one in the collection of the Department of Archives and History that, as far as we know, is the only one left. It's huge. It's 10 feet by 6 feet. Wow. And uh, we had it conserved. It's had a rough life. It flew over a ship. Hmm. And then uh, we had a frame built around it, and we traveled it across the state along with the original uh, Constitution of Mississippi, um, in celebration of the bicentennial, sort of building excitement about the bicentennial and the opening of the two museums. So it, it has um, made an appearance, the flag and the Constitution together made an appearance in dozens of communities across the state, in libraries and community centers, and uh, people planned really uh, fun and innovative celebrations of, of having the, the uh, flag and Constitution in their town. And it has now been placed in its new home uh, it, it's on permanent exhibit in the uh, Museum of Mississippi History. For all Mississippians and whoever else is interested That's to right. see. Uh, the starting flag belongs to the people and it's there for the people to see. There in December. Talk to us a little <laughs> bit about the significance of the Constitution. We, we get what a flag is. What's the significance of this, of this first Constitution? This is Mississippi's first Constitution from 1817. This is the original doc document, not a replica. Um, Mississippi's, the early history of Mississippi statehood is reflected in its constitutions in very interesting ways. Uh, and that story will be told in the Museum of Mississippi History and it's also told in greater depth in the Old Capitol Museum. But I think it's really special for people to see um, the actual historic document 
Um, and we were very glad that, that thousands of Mississippians had a chance to come see it. And then the, the constitutions are sort of on rotating exhibit uh, in the Old Capitol and the History Museum. What goes into keeping a document like that preserved, where you can display it like you're doing? Well, it's, uh, it's always a, 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 there's a little bit of push and pull between our museum folks who want to exhibit um, <laughs> these, these rare documents and artifacts and our, yeah, and, our, and our archivists who are charged with, with caring for them because uh, obviously when you take it out and move it and put it mm -hmm. on exhibit, it's exposed to light and, uh, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it has a, a little wear and tear on, mm -hmm. the, on the document, but uh, our archivists are, are specialists in caring for uh, historic documents, and they take very good care of them, and of course we want to share them with the public. Let's talk about the museums now. Judge Banks, you've been involved uh, from an early stage in these various committees that have been formed over the years to get us to this point. Uh, give us a, a brief synopsis, if you can, uh, of how we got to this point. Well, as, as I understand the history, and I've been involved in all of it, uh, there, there has been an effort to get a Mississippi History Museum done for, for some time, mm -hmm. uh, going back to the, uh, Governor William Winter's term as, as chair of the Mississippi Department, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, the, 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 uh, the old state capitol has served as our museum. It's not large enough, not suitable to be a museum, and there was an effort to get a suitable museum for the state of Mississippi. Uh, during uh, Governor Barber's administration, he came up with the idea of also having a Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and appointed a, a commission to study that. Uh, that commission came back with a recommendation to have a civil rights museum, and eventually uh, the two museum projects came together. Uh, there was a, su a suitable land next to the uh, Department of Archives and History, and the legislature authorized the, uh, the construction uh, of these two museums. Why two museums, Katie? Because uh, the, we're, we're, they're both opening at the same time. Uh, they, they are right next to each other. Why not have one large museum that encompasses all of this material? The idea is that the Museum of Mississippi History uh, covers the entire sweep of our state's history from the earliest times to the present, uh, including all aspects, including the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Museum focuses on the period 1945 to 1976 when Mississippi was ground zero for the Civil Rights Movement nationwide. So we tell the whole story in one museum and then we put a closer focus on an era of Mississippi history that changed the, the nation, if not the world. Let's talk specifically about the Civil Rights Museum then. Now, uh, Pam, you were the director there. Uh, the first question is, will you be ready by December 9th when the museum is scheduled to open? Of course we'll be ready. <laughs> we'll, of course we'll be ready. Yes, we'll be ready. Tell me about some of the things that folks will be able to see and interact with inside the museum. It's, it's a wonderful museum. It is phenomenal. There are eight galleries and there's a rotunda. It's like a circle. And, but there's a rotunda in the middle. That gallery is called This Little Light of Mine. Mm -hmm. And there's a 37-foot sculpture with all these lights entangled within each other. They're blades. They're all entangled. And what it, it signifies is that Mississippi had lights that came in. These were people that came in and changed Mississippi. Outside agitators, they were called. Once That's upon what they a time. were called. Mm -hmm. but, but people like Bob Moses, Ella mm -hmm. Baker, who, who talked to Bob Moses and told him about this, this Mississippi, and he was able to come in with all these people and make a change that mm -hmm. is, is going on even now. You look at these same people that are out there throughout the United States, throughout the world, that use those, that same example that was used so many years ago to make a difference in so many people's lives. It's gonna be wonderful. Again, there are eight galleries, and one of the other galleries is a closed society, a wonderful place that talks about World War II, it talks about the school systems, and how they were separate, but, uh, but not equal. They, it's a wonderful museum. Tell us about something in the museum that maybe folks have never seen before that they'll be able to experience for the first time once they come to visit. Well, you know, for me, let me just say this, and I've seen this before, but the Parchman Prison, there's a small example of how it looked, hmm. and people are able to walk in there 
and uh, there's audio visual, they'll be able to have a touch screen. That, that part is really wonderful because now you're thinking about people like Fannie Lou Hamer. Now you're thinking about Uvesta Simpson, June Johnson, and Hollis Watkins, these people who were in the Parchment Jail, and just really know the stories and, and understand how they felt when they were in the jail. Because, of course, Parchment is still with us, but it's the fact that these folks were sent to Parchment yes. under uh, pretty primitive conditions for doing things that today are perfectly legal and we expect. You know, one thing that you'll see, and I just saw that today, is a handwritten note written on toilet paper from one of the prisoners. Hmm. Phenomenal, and I, I've often wondered, how did this paper stay together? It's how the did, actual yes, toilet paper. and it's very from the legible, prison. very legible, wow. and they wrote out uh, like a diary, just how they felt, what was going on. It's amazing. Hmm. There is a chess set that's made out of toilet paper uh, or soap. Mm -hmm. And it's just wonderful to see how the pieces and how they use their own saliva to put this together. Wow, wow. Yeah. How many artifacts are on display there at the Civil Rights Museum? You know, I, I can't, I'm not sure. Exactly. About 500, wow. yeah. It's, it's, it's not, of course, as many as it would be in the Museum of Mississippi History. But we're here now. People are going to see what's going on there. They're going to see this, this museum is authentic. It's truthful, so they're going to be bringing in artifacts. We are getting calls now from people <laughs> who are wanting to bring in uh, artifacts from their father, from their grandparents, uh -huh. and that's wonderful for us. Tell us about some of the photographs that are on display at the museum. Oh, my goodness. Um, there's one wonderful, the, the Breach of Peace. Hmm. They're all over the wall. You look up. The Tougaloo Nine, they, mm -hmm. who were just here, uh, and those are the nine students from Tougaloo exactly. who, who went to had a read-in, so to speak, at yes. the Jackson Library, and were arrested simply for going in and, and reading in the library. Yes, and and from that we've had the actual photographer who wants to donate the the camera. So right. things are happening just for that. From that, you have uh, Brenda Travis from the Macomb Group. You have pictures of 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 Union soldiers. I mean the slave ship. We have monoliths of, of people who were lynched in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. There's so much to see. It's, it's, it's amazing. Well, you, you say that people are coming forward saying they want to contribute now, and obviously there was a call for folks to do that before the, in the early stages of this. Will you be able to add to the museum over the years? If someone comes up with something that's wonderful that must be on display, <laughs> will you be able to reconfigure to, to accept it? Well, I'm sure that that's something that we'll all be talking about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real soon, but it's just, it is amazing that people are calling now because they see the building. They understand that it's here, mm. and they hear us coming and going out and talking about these museums so you know people say yes this is real we want to have to display our grandparents artifacts uh, Rachel, let's talk about the, the, the proper name, the, the Museum of Mississippi History. <laughs> it Have is I got apparently that right? a little confusing, yes. <laughs> it is M's. the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Museum of Mississippi History. The Museum of Independent Mississippi. Independent individual museum. Yours covers, obviously, a much wider time period because 15, it's... 15,000 years. 15,000. So the beginning to, to present. Mm -hmm. give, us, give us a quick synopsis <laughs> of what you can find in there. Well, I've been laughing with folks. As you walk in, you're in an orientation theater with a nine-minute film which covers 15,000 years of history, <laughs> so it's quick and efficient. Uh, but essentially, it's the same thing. It's, um, we have 11 galleries that move chronologically through time. Uh, we have a few thematic breakout galleries that are, are capturing a little bit of Mississippi history in a different way, but um, essentially, you're, you're taking a walk through history. And tell us about some of the artifacts that are in your museum. Yeah, the theme of the museum is one Mississippi, many stories. So each gallery is really defined by um, uplifting these voices that you know we haven't necessarily heard before throughout Mississippi history. So uh, the artifacts, I love the large things and I like the little things. So such we, as? Such <laughs> as this you know, 25 foot long, 500 year old canoe. It's the very first thing that you see when you walk into the, into the museum. Where did it come from? Oh, it was dredged out of a river somewhere in Mississippi in the early in the early 90s, mm -hmm. late 80s, uh, and now it's on exhibit in the museum. And so I'm excited about the potential of people connecting with things that are that old and realizing that the folks that built those had the same dreams and desires mm -hmm. and lives that we have today and making personal connections to history. We think of Mississippi only in terms of the past almost 200 years. Uh, obviously, you're covering 15,000. How, how much of the museum is devoted to uh, the, the native uh, peoples here in Mississippi? Yeah, we have a very large gallery. Um, it's called First 
First Peoples. Um, that's then we can move into First Contact. And we have a breakout gallery called Enduring Cultures, which is about the contemporary experience of Native people here in Mississippi and also in Oklahoma, um, up to the territorial period. So we have three full galleries before we end up a state. Wow. Well, what would you think will be the most surprising thing in the museum? What, what are you most excited for people to see in the museum when it opens? This museum, people are going to find things that are familiar and nostalgic mm. and that, that resonates with them and mm. their Mississippi experience. Uh, I think the surprising things are the voices that haven't been told before. It's the perspectives from um, a variety of groups of people in Mississippi that don't necessarily have document, documents and, and government records, but we're displaying their stories throughout these artifacts in different ways. Uh, I think people will be surprised by the way that their communities and their neighbors have a Mississippi experience that is a little different from theirs. What about overlap, where obviously you're covering this, this wide swath of history, and Pam, the, the Civil Rights Museum, covers uh, that specific part of it. Uh, how did you manage to not overlap and duplicate some of the same uh, items and pieces of history? Well, I don't think we really overlap because on Rachel's side, of, of course, there's 15,000 years of history that we really go into. We really go into that history of 30 years, really delving into talking about the people, getting into who they were, how, why did they come into Mississippi? So that was really important to us. So any scholars that want, that want to know information about what happened during those 30 years, they come on our side to see that. Do you have any idea yet, and I, I, I throw this to any of the four of you, uh, what the response is going to be like? I mean, the most, uh, we, we talked before we, we started the program here about the, the national uh, African American history in, in Washington and the overwhelming response to it. Do you have any idea what kind of reception to expect and what kind of crowds to expect? Uh, we, we put, uh, we're free uh, opening weekend. Uh, but we asked people to sign up online for timed passes so that we could uh, sort of control the number of, of people in the building at any one time. And the, the timed passes disappeared on the first day. We added more wow. and they were gone immediately. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of excitement. And in fact, we've been in close touch with the, the uh, Smithsonian Museum uh, because they learned a lot about, um, about how best to accommodate uh, large demand, you know, right mm -hmm. at first when you open. And we've learned a lot from them. We're thrilled that, that people are, are excited that we're opening, and um, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how to get the most people in and give them a great experience um, right when we open. Because if you got the sense from these signups, are these people who are local, Mississippians, who can't wait to see this, or people who are Both. coming from far away? There are a lot of people traveling for this. We had a huge, made a huge media impact when we broke ground in 2013, and that's been building ever since, and we, we uh, there's been a lot of media interest in the opening um, and a lot of just kind of excitement mm. building. Again, the bicentennial year kind of helped build excitement. Uh, and, and we will be, although we're, we're the tickets for the opening, the, for the museum's opening weekend are sold out, there's lots of other ways to celebrate the opening. We hope people will come and, and um, participate in the, in the ceremony and then watch the ribbon cutting. There'll be music, and uh, it's a day-long free festival uh, open to the public. And that's sort of the culmination of this series that's of right. bicentennial this is events. The, the third of the large regional bicentennial celebrations, um, funded by the Mississippi Legislature in celebration <clears throat> of the bicentennial, and then uh, the legislature also funded uh, smaller celebrations around the state through a grant program. Um, that was managed by the Mississippi Humanities Council. So there were all different kinds of celebrations all across the state, uh, people expressing their different ideas of, of what it means to celebrate Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think was so special about Mississippi's um, bicentennial celebration. And we hope that, that everybody comes and joins us on December 9th um, for the celebration of the opening museums. And then the doors will open again uh, to the public on the 12th. Uh, which is Tuesday. The museums cl are closed on Monday, and then on Tuesday, uh, we'll have uh, tickets that are no longer free, but you, but they'll be available again. Tuesday is not sold out. Judge Banks, are you excited that so many people seem to be so excited about uh, about the 200th birthday and the museums? I am. It it, it was a, a daunting task when we took it on mm -hmm. uh, because we were required to raise sufficient private money. 
uh, to enhance the uh, amount of money that the uh, that the state put forward through uh, legislative actions, and we were we were we have been successful uh, in raising over twenty million dollars from private funds to support these. Uh, these museums, so the do, people out there are enthusiastic. And does that pay for everything, or does that just get us started, or, or how much uh, how much needs to be paid? On? Obviously, you need to continue to raise money <laughs> <laughs> to keep to keep going, but yes. it, it does pay for everything that we have right now. And yeah. admission fees and that type yeah, of thing right. uh, moving right. forward. Yeah. The state put ninety million dollars into these museums. It's it's an extraordinary uh, statement of Mississippi's values on the uh, on the occasion of mm -hmm. our bicentennial. Um, and the, as, as Judge Banks said, the Foundation for Mississippi History has led a very successful fundraising campaign. We're very grateful to our generous donors. Uh, the state, th th this is the first state-operated civil rights museum in the nation. Um, and the, so the state will continue to operate both of these museums, enhanced by the money that is raised mm -hmm. privately uh, for additional programming and, and so forth. Well, native peoples, European settlers, African slaves, cotton, the Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, just a few things uh, that are included there. What lessons can we take from all of that and from what's, uh, what's in the museums and from our 200th birthday? Uh, what lessons can we take uh, from that moving forward? I'd like to hear from each of you on this. Rachel? Oh, me first. Uh, those stories define us as a people and as a community. And so I think by learning where we've been um, and about a variety of different perspectives and experiences, again, that only helps inform the relationships that we have between each other today. Pam? Uh, for me, I think that we're more the same than we are different. And I think that when they go through these museums, they're gonna realize that and then start thinking about where do we go from here? What do we do to make Mississippi the best Mississippi that it can be? Judge Banks? Yeah, I think I've said over and over during this campaign that he who knows nothing of the past has little understanding of the present and no conception of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping that uh, we can close that gap through these museums. Okay. These museums are full of, of the stories of real Mississippians uh, throughout our history, uh, but the most important story of all is that Mississippians are telling these th stories through our own voices. We're telling them honestly and in all of their complexity, uh, and that we're doing so as a, as a way of celebrating our, our shared past uh, on the occasion of our bicentennial. Katie, this adds to sort of a complex now downtown. Right next to these two museums is the still relatively new Mississippi Department of Archives and History, the William Winter uh, right. building there, which That's itself right. is already quite an attraction for people from far That's away, right? right? That's right. Uh, the Department of Archives and History has been around since 1902, and it's a comprehensive state historical agency. We have the archives, the old Capitol Museum, a number of other historic and cultural attractions across the state, the Historic Preservation Program, and now these two new museums. Uh, it's a, it, we call it a historical campus, and, and particularly these two museums uh, will be the largest classroom in the state. Uh, we'll be bringing school children in, we're raising private money uh, to help fund school visits, field trips, even for schools that, that haven't been able to take field trips lately. Uh, and we're sending educational resources out across the state um, in, in, we, we've always done that, but we're able to do that, that uh, in, in new and improved ways thanks to resources that we've brought in through this two museums project. Judge Banks, these youngsters, in particular these students who, who come to visit uh, the museums, what do you hope they will take away from the experience of, uh, of going through those? Well, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get to see and feel and learn. That's what I hope that they'll take away. And they will, they will be able to recognize and care for with the story of Mississippians, native Mississippians who gave their lives uh, for the cause of freedom. Uh, and then we have, uh, we will have a, as an artifact Vernon Damer's truck that was burned. Mm. I mean, the the wow. name Vernon Damer will be, will be prominent. Mm. Uh, Medgar Evers will be prominent. Mm. The, uh, the various civil rights workers who gave their lives uh, or gave up their lives in order to achieve uh, uh, equality in the state will, will be there. So it's, 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 something that they will be able to look at and see and feel uh, in a greater way than just reading about it. Back to the museum directors over here. What's the pressure like to get this right, to make sure every detail is presented uh, faithfully and accurately? Pam? It's a lot of pressure. Just, just walking through the museum today 
and uh, just wanting to make sure that everything is right because we're going to have historians coming through, <laughs> scholars coming through, <laughs> and, and just family members. We want to yeah. make sure that this museum is right where they can be so proud of it. A lot and of go the out history and, is still with us. A oh, lot, yeah, you mentioned oh, yes. Bob Moses. He's still yes. very much uh, with us and will be able to uh, experience it himself. That had to be a, an interesting journey for this process as well, that so many of these people and, and whose uh, legacies are being profiled are still with us. Oh, yeah. I think about Hollis Watkins coming mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And that's going to, I talked to him yesterday. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll be there. Wow. So, you know, we're, we're looking for them to come in. We want them to talk to us and tell us if we need to do anything right. But I think they're just happy and excited that now Mississippi has a Civil Rights Museum. Rachel? And we're happy to hear from people. You know, one of the devices in the History Museum is a reflection booth where mm -hmm. you push a button and you can record your own story. Mm -hmm. um, those stories will play throughout four of our galleries in the museum. So there's an opportunity to visitors to hear other visitors' stories, mm -hmm. uh, but also visitors to be sure that their story is being told. That's, that's going to be a consistent theme of, of our museum. Uh, Pam, how much uh, does racial reconciliation play a role in the, the Civil Rights Museum? It's very important. It's very important to the point that we are talking with people so that we can have programs that can work with schools. We're looking at bringing school children together, black children, white children, and let them see what went on during the movement so that now in today's society, the 21st century, that we can figure out ways that we can really work together. This is going to be an educational tool. This is going to be a classroom for diversity, for racial reconciliation. As I like to say, racial empowerment. Mm -hmm. Because once you bring us together, we're going to be empowered to go out and make it right. Rachel Myers, Pam Jr., Katie Blunt, Fred Banks, thank you all for being with us on At Issue. And mark your calendar, there will be a Mississippi Bicentennial Concert Celebration and the opening of the two museums in Jackson on December 9th. And for more information on that event, go to twomuseumsopening.com. We're out of time for tonight. Don't forget, you can check out the program on our website, mpbonline.org issue. And we invite you to join us again here next Friday night for another edition of At Issue on MPB. Good night.